So welcome back. I hope you found that last session fascinating. I, I certainly did myself. And obviously what we've seen through the last two, three days is a significant amount of transformation, technology-based transformation across almost every area in the greater China uh, region, e-commerce, mobility, fintech, clean tech. Now this next session is gonna do really a deep dive on the region to really understand the major forces, the key enablers, including public policy that have contributed to China's rapid growth in technology-based innovation. We're also gonna get a better understanding about where investment is happening there locally and the most promising areas of innovation. Now I'm uh, very, very honored and pleased to introduce to you our moderator of our final session, Professor Christine Lowe. She's a visiting professor at UCLA Anderson where she teaches a course on non-market risks. She's the former deputy minister for the environment in the Hong Kong SAR government. Her direct policy responsibilities included air quality, energy, climate change, and biodiversity. She serves as the chief development strategist at the Institute for the Environment at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, as well as advises organizations on climate change and sustainability. In this final session, our panelists, who Professor Lowe will introduce, will share their insights and observations on the region's unique context, uh, context. For the final session, once again, we'll have time for audience questions. Please pose your questions in the Slido tool, which is embedded at the bottom of your screen. And as a reminder, you can enter your own question or you can upvote one of the existing ones and Professor Lowe will then take those questions. Professor Lowe, pleasure to have you here and I'll turn it over to you now. Terry, thank you very much for including me in this session. Um, the last session that Terry hosted with uh, Ambassador David Gross was very fascinating. And uh, Ambassador Gross talked about innovation and technology on uh, a global basis, talked about the situation in the US, in the EU, in China, and also how things happen there have a much wider global impact. And as Professor Kramer said, we're now going to concentrate on greater China in terms of innovation and technology. And I'm delighted to have two extremely um, experienced people in this area to have this conversation. We're gonna talk till the top of the hour, and then I'm going to welcome questions from the audience. So my two panelists today are, first of all, Andy Rothman. He is the investment strategist of Matthews Asia, an independent investment specialist founded in 1991. Using a long-term fundamental investment approach, the firm manages a broad range of Asia-focused investment solutions on behalf of institutions, advisors, and individual investors globally. Uh, together with Andy, we have Albert Wong, who's the CEO of Hong Kong Science and Technology Park, a statutory body dedicated to building a vibrant innovation and technology ecosystem to deliver benefits to Hong Kong and the wider region. The park is Hong Kong's largest R&D hub with over 11,000 researchers, 1,000 tech companies, and home to unicorns and startup. So gentlemen, without further ado, I'd like to start asking you a number of questions. We'll go from broad to narrower to specifics, if that's okay with you. Now, Andy, um, let me start with you. And let's talk about the innovation landscape in Greater China today. The largest part of Greater China is of course, mainland China. And it has a government with a socialist state-led system. It has many state-owned enterprises today. Many of them are listed companies. And also China has a bustling uh, private sector. So I'd like to hear from you, where do you think innovations are coming from today? 
Thanks, Christine. That's a great way to start. And thanks to you and the organizers at UCLA for inviting me to participate today. I'd like to talk about how far China has come in a relatively short period of time to put this innovation in context. And the main point I want to make is that, well, it's still run by the Chinese Communist Party and they call it a socialist system. It's one of the most entrepreneurial market-driven places in the world. So let's take a step back to when I first went to China as a student in 1980. Uh, China was so poor at that time, just coming out of the Cultural Revolution, that per capita GDP in China, when I first went there, just four decades ago, was lower than in Afghanistan, Haiti, and Bangladesh. It was really poor. I went back to work there in 1984 as a very junior American diplomat at the US consulate in Guangzhou. And at that time, technology was so poor, just the phone service was so weak. We had a fleet of bicycle messengers at the US consulate in order to be able to be sure that we could get messages to the Chinese government or other people that we were trying to talk to. Fast forward today, obviously it's a much wealthier place. Over the last decade on average, China has accounted for one third of global economic growth. That's a larger share of global growth than from the US, Europe and Japan combined. China went from a place that couldn't feed itself when I first went there to now accounting for about 20% of global luxury sales. How did this happen? It didn't happen because of state-owned enterprises, which is the way that a lot of people still think about China. It happened because the state got out of the way and set in place market-based reforms over the last several decades. So again, when I first worked in China in 1984, there were no private companies at all. You couldn't even find a privately run restaurant. Today, about 90% of urban employment is just small entrepreneurial private companies all of the net new job creation is from these small private firms because the state sector, while it's still significant, is shrinking. All of the innovation comes from those companies. In fact, the government has acknowledged that 70% of innovation comes from the private sector in China. I'm guessing it's probably significantly more than that. Now, that doesn't mean the government doesn't get credit for this because getting out of the way was the most important thing they could do and let Chinese people be entrepreneurial and to create a framework, both in terms of the economy and the legal system, including the protection of intellectual property rights, to allow that to happen. Now, it's far from perfect, but it has become an incredibly entrepreneurial place. And that's why, if you look at how we invest for our clients in China, we're primarily investing in privately owned, publicly traded Chinese companies selling goods and services to Chinese consumers. And it's in a remarkable story in a really short period of time, Christine. Right. Well, thank you. Uh, let's also hear from Albert, who also has a very long track record, I know, uh, working in China. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how you see China going from an agricultural rural economy that Andy uh, just described to us to where it is today? Yeah, great. Um, this is a great start. Um, Andy and I are going to uh, feel a little bit nostalgic, right? I'm going to talk about the 80s. The first time when I tra started traveling in China was when I was 20-something. Uh, um, first of all, by the way, although I'm working for a statutory body, I'm not really a civil servant. And all, I spent all my life working for multinationals, U.S. companies. Um, I spent my last 15 years prior to coming back to Hong Kong in GE. And one of my positions at that time was that um, actually really during the heydays of... Um, multinational exploring technology businesses in China. I was the um, uh, GE China Chief Commercial Officer. So I was actually involved in strategic planning, commercial development, technology development for a multinational um, at that time. And um, uh, sounding, uh, with the risk of sounding nostalgic, and um, in the 80s, I really agree with uh, Andy, and uh, it was a big change, and change uh, were happening really fast in the past 30, 40 years. Um, I was a 20-something uh, engineer in the in petroleum exploration, and um, and I was considered an expert because I've been training over I've been trained overseas, and then in the um, uh, and um, I, we've been treated very well because we brought, we brought in technologies, and then a few years later in the 90s, then uh, we become a one of the strongest competitors. We are all expert. In the 2000, we we became one of the players. In 2010, 2021, 2020, we we are we are considered just 
one of the competitors in parallel with the Chinese manufacturers in energy, in healthcare and everything. The transition in the past 30, 40 years is that China has been really putting a lot of resources into developing technology innovation. And um, in at one time when I was doing a strategic analysis with GE, we were actually comparing China in the 2000s with the Japan of the 60, 70, right? Japan in, at that time were developing, you got big companies like Mitsubishi, Hitachi, Sony, all these were coming up. But what did they do at the beginning? They were just copying, all right? They, at that time, I, re, I still remember that uh, when I was young, that um, the Japanese electronics and Japanese products were considered copied of the Germans. And then next thing you know, nowadays made in Japan is considered a um, lux luxury, the good things. And I think China is also going, has been going through the transition. Now, I, I, was, I was talking about things like, in 2008, in the Olympics, China was starting the uh, development of the high-speed rail. And at that time, I still remember very well that the, the world was um, allocating and saying that China is copying all the technology from different parts of the world. Nowadays, the high-speed rail in China is the biggest in the world, the most advanced in the world. All right. Um, so so I, I, I'm looking at China starting from learning from the, from the rest of the world, improvise, and then nowadays becoming indigenous. Now we can talk later about, you know, what are the technologies that have been developing. I would like to hear from others and Andy and what, what have been going on. But, you know, this is the kind of natural progression that I've, I've been seeing in China over the past 30, 40 years. Now, if you see all these things going on in China in the past 30, 40 years, uh, you can expect what is going to happen in the, in the next um, uh, 20, 30 years. Another thing that's happening also is the... Um, accomplishment by the Chinese government or the Chinese um, innovation is that I remember when I when I started traveling in the 80s, 90s, the difference um, between a, a city in China and, and the ancient China is just the light bulb. And um, the, the development, the urbanization is happening so fast. And uh, there's a lot of um, leapfrogging technologies such as payment, fintech, smart cities have been happening, 5G, because they have the leapfrog. So a lot of um, urbanization has been going on. Um, a lot of uh, technology development has, has been going on. And um, this is to, to China, this is a survival. And uh, we can talk a little bit more about uh, Greater Bay and the role of Hong Kong later, but this is the macro picture that I've seen in the past, I would say 40 years. And uh, it's, um, it, is, it is mind boggling how, how all these things have happened in the past 40 years. Right. Um, well, maybe I can ask uh, Andy, um, in terms of China's policies today, I mean, obviously, I think for both you and Albert, um, you know, there's the government, there are these companies, we talked about Chinese people, very entrepreneurial, um, but, you know, in order to go from where they were 40 years ago to where they are today, there must have been tremendous training and education of the workforce. So say something um, about the range of policies on science and technology. And also China has a digital China policy and already in, in, at the Wu conference, we talked about you know, FinTech, green tech, um, uh, combining these different things uh, to charge forward. So perhaps I can just start with Andy, give us a sense of um, uh, uh, how, how are Chinese policies shaping um, the next five to 10 years, or maybe further down the road? That's a really timely question, because one of the ways that you can tell how innovative China has become is that a lot of people in the United States are starting to get afraid of China. Um, and so they're looking to China and saying, how has China caught up or come close to catching up with the United States in technology and innovation? across everything from the internet to biotech. And I think a lot of people in the United States are coming to the wrong conclusion that the way China has caught up or come close to catching up is because they have a state-driven industrial policy and that the state is guiding this rise in innovation. And my view is that's not what happened. That's not as what happened. What I think has happened is primarily that the government has created the infrastructure Primarily the soft part of the infrastructure, getting back to the education that you mentioned, the number of university graduates has risen at a dramatic pace over the last 15 years. 
the number of Chinese students going abroad to the U.S. and other places studying and then returning home and contributing to the growth there has been phenomenal. Um, improvement of protection of intellectual property rights has been a big part of it. You know, when I was working in the American embassy in the 90s, it was hard to get the Chinese government to pay attention to protecting IP because I think the attitude was, well, what, Microsoft and Disney don't have enough money? But around that time, the Chinese government realized that one of the things that was holding back entrepreneurs in China was that other Chinese companies were stealing their IP. And they saw that the court cases were primarily Chinese suing other Chinese. And so they realized the necessity to step up that. I think creating that framework for private companies, for entrepreneurs, for scientists to do their work, rather than an industrial policy which picked winners and losers and decided where to move was the thing that really worked. And so I'm a little bit saddened by the fact that some people here in the United States feel that, well, if we're going to stay ahead of China, let's copy their industrial policy programs and, and bring that here. Well, I, I, um, uh, Chris, let, let, me, let me add to this. I, I'm sorry, I, I'm just jumping in because this is a um, very important part of the discussion. So, um, and uh, we have been witnessing the um, development of China, like the uh, special economic zones in Shenzhen and a number of them. And at that time, Deng Xiaoping was using that as a as experiments, um, and they just let people just go crazy, and they, they just want a few people uh, to get rich. And like Andy was saying at the very beginning, that really, you know, uh, blew up the entrepreneurial spirit of the Chinese people, and you just let them let them go, let them go crazy, and let a few people get rich and become um, middle class, and it, it seemed to work. Now, one of the things that I, I remember in working in GE, one of the lawyers was telling me that um, in, the, um, in the Western world, in the US, if it's not written as illegal, it is, it is legal, you can do it. In China, you look at it differently. Unless it is, you're told that it's Ill, it legal, don't do it. However, the Chinese government has this, this kind of um, um, encouragement to everybody that you just go crazy, just try it until I tell you to stop. I mean, you you can see that, like you know, Jack Ma, Alibaba, and and and, and Tencent, because we we have we did not have the have the have the have the way we did not know what is going on. So at the very beginning, they would just let the pendulum swing and just go crazy, just try it. However, you got to be very careful. Listen to the lawyers that um, in China, unless it is specifically written as legal, it is not legal. They can change it. However, they, they, in the past, there have been encouragement of things that have not happened. And that is why a lot of things have been happening in China. And I believe things will continue to happen because of that kind of you know, um, uh, passion, culture, and the way that the Chinese government is run. Well, maybe I can add a comment uh, because I watched the last um, session with Ambassador David Gross, who talked about uh, one of these issues. And they talked about in the United States that um, obviously the culture believes in the market and, and then you let the market go and then you look at how to regulate. So in a way, it perhaps is the same with China. Uh, in China, there isn't much of a regulatory system. The entire, over the last 40 years, I think both for Andy and Albert, one of the things that China had to do was not only to train people, i.e. a workforce, but to put in laws and regulations. And all these things that you guys are talking about in innovation and technology and industry and so on, which is not there. So that this, so perhaps what you're saying, Albert, is the only way was to say, okay, um, we really don't know what the future might look like. We don't know which are the right products and innovations we're going to let the entrepreneurs get on with it, and then we will regulate. I think this is what you're saying, Albert. Yeah. And what yeah. you're saying is this is going to continue in the future as well. I, I, Christine, I think this is a very good uh, segue into, into the discussion. I think this is important. I say um, almost a cultural kind of things that um, the Chinese government will encourage you to try new things and you, you, you want to do it. However, I, I, I keep, keep, keep going back to what the lawyer, GE lawyer, told me that unless it's specifically written it's legal, it is not legal. I think the most important thing, and we did a lot of that when I worked for GE, is that we work with the government. And the government officials at the city level and the, and the, and the cent, cent, uh, central government level, they want to listen to your advice because they don't know. These people are humble, all right? Um, just so that, you, I mean, I think the most important thing is that you don't want to overwhelm them. You want to be part of the whole thing because they, nobody understands. You know, um, technology by definition has not happened. 
right? And and if, if I start regulating everything from tech, on technology today, technology is gonna it's not gonna go. So I, I would I would I mean if if I can uh, I'm continue to do things in China and anyone who wants to do things in China is to you know just keep trying but make sure that you work with the government because the government is a very key part of the whole development regulation and technology development. Okay, Andy, I'm going to ask you what you think of that, and also both of you. Um, well, on this basis, what do you think are some of the uh, most exciting things that you think could happen in the next, let's say, five to 10 years? Andy, you go first. Okay, well, before I talk about the exciting part, let me spend a couple of minutes trying to address what I hear from investors in the United States and in, in Europe is the greatest concern about the future of technology and entrepreneurship uh, and innovation in China. Um, um, many of you are probably aware that last year there was a regulatory crackdown, which mm. had a big impact uh, primarily on internet platforms, but on a wide range of technology companies in China. And many people outside of China have viewed this as a decision by the leadership in China to roll back those market-based reforms that I was talking about before, to curb the influence of entrepreneurs, to stop people from getting rich, or to attack really rich people in China. And I think that's not what the Chinese government's trying to do. Uh, first, because they're still a really pragmatic government. The reason that things are going so well in China, COVID accepted for the moment, is that they have gotten out of the way and put these market-based reforms in and all the new job creation, as I mentioned before, is coming from private companies. It would be politically and economically suicidal for the Chinese government to try and stop that. I think instead what the Chinese government's trying to do under this rubric of common prosperity is address the same kinds of socioeconomic issues that we're all worried about here in the US. Inequality of income, inequality of wealth, unequal access to healthcare and education, and also on the business side, uncompetitive practices by some big firms, particularly online. So if that's what they're trying to do, and if they're halfway successful at that over the coming years, then I think they're going to create a better social and economic environment, which is gonna be really good for innovation. The problem is the government did a, a pretty bad job of starting this process last year. They didn't effectively communicate to their own people and to outsiders what they were trying to accomplish and they went too far and this is typically a bug in the system of overdoing it but getting back to what albert was talking about before they usually course correct when they overdo something we've seen this with power shortages and now we're seeing with the regulatory side where senior officials in the chinese government are saying hey we overdid it we need to have better coordination among our agencies and we're not trying to stifle innovation and we're not trying to roll back reforms so the key thing that I'm watching over the next several years is, can they actually do what they're saying, which is try and deal with these issues about, um, for example, if you're a gig worker, whether it's for Uber or for DD in China, are you getting a decent take-home pay? Is the, is the company contributing to your social security, to your healthcare? Um, are they putting reasonable limits in place on pressure on how many deliveries you make every hour so it's not too dangerous? This, I think, is gonna be the key towards further innovation in China is having a reasonable approach to common prosperity. And I think that's what they're trying to do. Now in terms well, and, of, mm, please, sorry, Andy, I'll just hold you here because I think what, you're, what I'm hearing you say is that the Chinese government, like other governments actually have to solve real world problems. And you're going to watch to see whether they manage to solve some of these problems, including for example, uh, how it deals with workers and, you know, how they're actually going to regulate and so on. So before we come back to, you know, the five to 10 years, right, you're, where, where you think it's lucky, uh, where you think it's, it has the best luck going forward, perhaps I can ask Albert to jump in here. Yeah, definitely. I, I think um, in the next five to 10 years, I, I think, I think Christine, you're hitting on a very important part of the, of the whole thing, because China is 1.5 billion in population. It's a lot of people. It's a big country. Um, a lot of things happening. Um, China will play a big role in in the environmental protection, in sustainability, in green. Will play a big role in energy. Will play a big role in transportation, aerospace. 
Um, and, and this is just part of the whole survival thing for China. It's going to happen. And, uh, and the Chinese government will solve these big problems. And uh, I think we, we want to be part of, it, part of the, whole, the whole thing. Andy, do you want to come back on that? Yeah, I'm also pretty optimistic, and I, I don't think I want to narrow it down to any one sector because I think the innovative capacity of entrepreneurs in China in pretty much everything, whether it's pharmaceuticals or biotech or uh, software and hardware, uh, is significant. Um, I think, though, that one of the most important things, let's say, out over the next decade is going to be the U.S. government and the Chinese government getting their acts together because the two economies and innovation in both economies is so interconnected. Scientists, academics, medical researchers are all working jointly on everything from the next drug regimen for cancer to AI. And we, I think the most important thing that could get in the way of innovation in both countries is the governments not creating an environment that's conducive to collaboration on both sides. And I hope that people in Washington and Beijing and paying attention to that. Mm. And Christina, let me, let me add to this. I, I, yes. um, when you talk about the type of technologies, I, I guess we, we, we could get into that discussion, is that um, you know, in the past 20 years, you've been seeing China being the world factory, we're churning out a lot of products for the world. But at the same time, a lot is happening behind the scene, including the high-speed rail that, that we're so part of. I remember, again, this is a little bit of a segue. I remember at the beginning of the high-speed rail, at GE, we were analyzing and we were so concerned that it may be a comp competition to the whole you know, aviation industry. But guess what? I mean, aviation industry is only a small part of the whole transportation. And, um, and um, because the country is so big, you know, high-speed rail is becoming a, a, a important network of the, of the country. So transportation has been re definitely developing really quickly in China. Um, the other thing that happening is, is um, uh, communications like 5G, and future communications, AI data analytics is a huge deal in China because, you know, when you talk about AI, it's all about data, computing power, and we have all of that. So AI data is happening very quickly. The other things that are happening is in general, we call things like smart cities, like, you know, e-businesses, fintech, all those things. Now, I think in the coming, and, and, and China is also doing very well in the areas of green, in the electric state, because one of the um, country's strategic direction is that um, because China is a net importer of energy like oil, um, we have to go into a kind of electric state. That is why electric vehicle is developing so fast in China. So these are the things that are macro and are happening in China. In my opinion, in, in the coming few years and 20, 10, 20 years, apart from all this AI, transportation, communication, smart city things, China is going to put a lot of resources into biomedical, genomics, healthcare technologies. That's definitely going to happen. Although you, you can argue that a lot, a lot of money has been put into this area. I don't think that a lot has happened yet. I mean, and you, you can look around, there is zero blockbuster drug coming out from Asia, not just China, anywhere. So in the therapeutics area, there will be a lot more resources being put into healthcare technology, biomedical, therapeutics, diagnostics. That's one big area, in my opinion. And I, I believe that there, there will be a lot of uh, continued uh, resources into the green sustainability energy. Um, because you look at the world nowadays, is, are we going to go into oil fossil fuel? Are we going to really go into green? Can we go into net zero? Are we going to go to nuclear? This, this will be happening in the next, next few years. And then the other thing that I think we need to think about is the aviation aerospace area. That I believe China is also putting a lot of research money into it. Um, I think these are the exciting areas that um, that we should be looking at. And we can talk a little bit more about the investment part of that. That will be another discussion. But uh, in my opinion, these are the things that will happen. Well, uh, maybe I can press the point that Andy brought earlier on, which is about deteriorating US China relations when they could be um, collaborating. And I think this is a concern for everybody. Now, Andy, since you advise investors globally, and uh, Albert, you're very aware of uh, the kind of technology that uh, from all around the world. Um, I, I, I mean, people overseas are really spooked by China right now. 
um, particularly people in, in the US. Um, so Andy, how are you advising uh, investors? And I think for Elbert, um, perhaps you can also address the role of Hong Kong going forward. So Andy, you go first. Uh, that's a, a great question. So from strictly from an investment perspective, I think it's important to remember that you know, China is the second largest economy in the world, but maybe even more importantly, it drives global growth. I mentioned before that every year on average, China is about a third of global growth, more than the US, Europe, and Japan combined. So a well-balanced investor's portfolio would wanna have some exposure to that. And then you'd wanna look for companies that are trying to stay out of the political problems between Beijing and Washington. And that's why we tend to focus on Chinese companies privately run companies that are selling goods and services to Chinese consumers rather than exporting things to the United States and maybe getting caught up in those political disputes. Um, we can see that Chinese companies still want to have access to the U.S. market. Uh, if you talk to securities lawyers working with Chinese companies, there is a long queue of companies that want to do their IPO, their initial public offering in the United States rather than in Hong Kong or in, in Shanghai. And so the, the interest is there. The interest from U.S. investors is still there as well. Uh, but we, if you take a step back away from the investment side, what I, I'm more worried about for all of our futures is that, and maybe looking at what's happening in Europe right now highlights this, we, both governments need to take a step back and get the relationship between these two countries back on track because it will be bad for innovation globally, it will be bad for all of us that are thinking about where the next um, breakthrough in battery technology is gonna come from, the next breakthrough in cancer therapies is gonna come from. That's all gonna be delayed if we see a rupture in scientific collaboration between the two countries. You're on mute. About Christine. maybe maybe you can talk a little bit about the role of Hong Kong. Yeah, well, I I I'll I'll, I'll, I'll uh, continue on what Andy was talking about. First of all, really, China is a big market. It's not just a so a destination of your investment, but also a source of investment. You know, in the past few years, number of uh, investment that are coming out outbound from China is also happening. So, however you look at it, this is a one point four billion people, second largest economy in the world, and uh, you just cannot ignore it. Um, the other thing I would I would add a little bit more about is the Chinese government are pragmatic people. I, I I'm not going to address the geopolitical things because it's beyond me, but the uh, the 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 Chinese government are pragmatic, humble. They will listen to business people. Um, they 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 want to be part of the development. Now, uh, when it comes to Hong Kong, um, I, I am a local, born, educated, raised in Hong Kong. Although I I I, I spend most of my time working overseas, Hong Kong is play is playing a very important role in being the gateway to the rest of the world, um, as much as Shanghai or Beijing. You know, um, in Shanghai, there, there are, there's probably three main outlet from China, in that outlet from China is Hong Kong, Shanghai, Beijing, and I lived in these three cities at different times of the world, different times of my life. Um, Hong Kong plays a very, very, very significant role because of the one country, two system. Whatever the, the media says, one country, two system is still happening. And, and I, I can tell you, it is happening. I am a local, I live here. I was born educated here, and uh, it is one country, two system. Um, it is uh, it is different, um, and we are very international. We have a biggest, uh, we have a, a big uh, financial market, and we have the uh, we're running by the um, uh, common law, and the way of life is different. And by the way, we drive on the right hand side of the road, and which is different than China. So we maintain that kind of uh, identity now. You have to consider Hong Kong, put Hong Kong into the context of the Greater Bay Area. Um, Hong Kong itself is a 7 million population. We have five universities that are ranked top 100 in the world. So Hong Kong plays a very important role in the technology in the research area. Because if you look at the whole Greater Bay Area in Southern China, there isn't one university that can compare with ours. We have five of them that are ranked top 100. Um, if you have to go to Shanghai, to Wuhan, to, to find a research university that can compete with us. So Hong Kong plays a very, very important role in the areas of finance, international, and also research. So the, uh, if, if you're going to set up a, let's say, a e-business, a Uber in China, don't, go, don't do it in Hong Kong because Hong Kong is only a 7 million population area. You go to Shanghai, go to Hangzhou, go to Shenzhen because you can have access to 80 million, 1.4 billion population. But if you're doing a biomedical, 
you know, uh, AI, data, trend, uh, telecom research related innovation, Hong Kong is as good as Shanghai, Shenzhen because of the support from research universities. So Hong Kong is a, is a very important role, plays an important, important role in the finance, in the gateway to the world and the research. Now, if you put it together with the Greater Bay Area, which is, uh, I'm sure you know about that, is um, nine cities, but Hong Kong and Macau. Hong Kong is a seven million city. And the Greater Bay Area, you go in the Greater Bay Area, all of a sudden you're looking at 86 million in population. And this is the area of the highest GDP of China. And coupled with, uh, with the um, Shenzhen and Hong Kong Research and, and Finance Center, you're looking at a huge opportunity. And uh, this, this, this is un, un, unusual. And uh, you can also even have an access to the 1.4 billion in China. So this is the kind of the role of the Greater Bay Area and, and of Hong Kong. And believe me, this is one country to system. And uh, we still maintain the, maintaining the live and, the, uh, and everything that is uh, different than China. And uh, I cannot emphasize that more, okay? Thank you. Well, um, I think we'll go to take some of the questions because there are quite a number of them. Uh, here's a question that I think was inspired by something that Andy said. If China has succeeded so well because the state got out of the way, what are the challenges now that it sees to be getting in the way and to clean things up? I think you've partially answered a bit of that question, but perhaps you can go slightly deeper into it. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think we also have to recognize that while it appears the, Ch the Chinese government is getting more in the way, this is not actually new. And it gets back to something that both Albert and I were talking about before, which is the government tends to not regulate initial activity and then step in when they see risks. So for example, Christine, you might remember that about 15 years ago, lots of people around the world were worried that the biggest risk in China was off balance sheet lending, P2P companies, trust companies, things like that. It was gonna blow up the Chinese financial system and be the end of China. Well, nobody's really talked about that in a long time because what the Chinese government had done was say to financial entrepreneurs, go ahead and see what you wanna do. And then we'll watch and we'll see risks. And they saw risks in P2P, for example. So they, after a few years, they pretty much shut the whole thing down. This is really typical in China throughout the reform period of the last few decades for the government to allow experiments to happen. Some of them work, some of them don't, they're course corrections. And I think what we're seeing right now is a series of course corrections because last year, the Chinese government's focus was on controlling risks and they overdid it on, on power related issues like uh, energy efficiency and carbon emissions and coal mine safety. So they've backed away, not from the objective, but how it gets implemented. On the property sector, they were worried about risks among a couple of dozen property developers, and they went after that, but they went too far and basically shut down the new home market for uh, the second half of last year. Now they're course correcting there, that's opening back up again. Um, on the internet platforms, the same thing, they went too far and they're course correcting. So we have to recognize that this is a risk of investing or doing business in China, because this is a feature of how China is working. And we might say that sounds weird to us or foreign to us, but we have to accept that it's actually worked out pretty well in China. And entrepreneurs in China, I think, understand this environment. This is one of the reasons why when you asked me about investment advice, I gave something specific. But I think for an investor or for a, a business school student right now, my main advice is no matter what you plan on doing in the future in terms of your investments, your career, knowing a fair amount about China is going to be really important. Even if you never go work in China, even if you never invest in a Chinese company, understanding what's actually happening in China beside beyond the headlines is really important because you probably know, or maybe you don't, that GM sells more cars every day in China than it does in the United States. Companies like Intel and Qualcomm get a huge percentage of their global revenue from China, Apple, uh, Nvidia, Tesla, so really understanding what's going on in China is probably the most important thing, I think, for somebody who's looking to start a business career, even if you're never going to get set foot in China. Right. Here's another uh, question. Let me, sorry, let me, let me add to this. I think this is also, um, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I like to chime in, but um, 
I think the government, Chinese government would let things happen, but the Chinese government is always there. Um, China is, a, is still a planned economy. And we talk about top level design all the time. Um, when things like um, uh, 5G networks happens and uh, high speed rail, green electric states, all these things are because of some high level, senior level strategic design of the country. And the, the country is always there. But when it comes to the micro level, when the business level, the government, local government will always get out of the way. And they always learn from you. I think that uh, uh, for the students uh, or for everyone, I think um, you have to know that there's such a thing called a five-year plan. The 14 five-year plan just happened just starting last year. And if you want to do business in China, I encourage you to read it. The, the five-year plan isn't just written when with someone sitting inside an office and spend five days uh, night, and night with writing about it. They consult a lot of people. And actually, I was one of the person being consulted as GE commercial per person. They, they write this five-year plan and they, and they deliver. It's not, a, it's not a really big document, but it spells out all the, all the high-level design, what are the things that they will, be, they will encourage all the policies that is going to happen in the next five years and they deliver. So if, if you're interested in doing business in, in this country, I would encourage you to read that 14 five-year plan. Well, this is a couple of interesting questions that are somewhat related. Um, uh, the, I guess the, the, the questions really come from, is, is there anything that you think that China does uh, on, you know, on government policy that the U.S. might learn something from. I'm packaging, you know, a number of questions um, uh, to uh, ask by a few people. So, I mean, Elbert, you talked about um, uh, five-year planning and it actually gets done. Now, in the last session, um, Ambassador David Gross said that, well, you know, people are in fact very impressed with China. And as Andy said right at the beginning, uh, maybe the Americans are even afraid of China because it seems to be doing so well. So, I mean, in terms of what are some of the areas where uh, you think China's uh, approach is actually very laudable and maybe other governments can uh, take a lesson from it? No, Christina, I, I'll be very, very careful answering the question. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> a politician. I don't think I can advise the, any government. Um, I, I, the only thing I would say I, I can advise a lot of people in a micro level, in a business level, investment level, but um, from government standpoint, I, I would really urge the government to really work with each other because innovation is not about, you know, hiding inside a room and invent something new and then tell the world. It's about collaboration. The world cannot survive with the two biggest power not talking to each other. In particular, you talk about technology innovation. Um, I, I think, I believe that the Chinese government is ready to talk and I believe that the, there's a lot of um, people in the U.S. government also ready to talk. I think it's just we just need to make it happen. I, I don't want to get into politics, but um, that's all I can say. <laughs> right. I mean, for example, we have another question here who's actually coming from one of the students who is doing the joint UCLA and the NUS, you know, of Singapore program uh, about the persona of today's Chinese government official. And uh, this student said, well, you know, the perception of the communist uh, official uh, is generally rather negative. Um, would maybe Andy, you'd like to comment on this because I think both you and Albert, you've ob obviously dealt with Chinese officials. Andy, would you like to have a go? Sure. Um, so overall, my experience is dealing with Chinese government officials, uh, especially while I was a, an American diplomat were generally positive. Uh, I think like other countries, they recruit really smart and talented people uh, and they train them. I think where the problems appear is when government officials speak in public and have to deliver a message that their bosses have handed them. Um, this happens in all governments, but I think that the Chinese government is still learning how to communicate with, how to speak to people who live in democracies. And they're early in the learning curve on that and not understanding that a message that might play well in their home audience doesn't resonate well in a lot of the rest of the world. And so I think this is a place where they can continue to make progress. 
Albert? Now, Christine, the only thing I would add is that um, Chinese government officials in general are pragmatic. I think that's the best description of them. They are, they are there because they have 1.4 billion mouths to feed. Uh, this, is, um, this is not an easy task. 1.4 billion in the large, second largest economy in the world, complicated diversity. Um, these are real pragmatic, pragmatic people and they are very humble people and uh, they want to get things done. And you got to, I think, I think the only, only thing that you got to realize is that, uh, like Andy was saying, these people climb, climb the ladder through a, a performance-based uh, credit system rather than through a democratic election. These are very different type of systems. So they, 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 they got to, the, to, the, to where they are because of their performance in the past. And um, uh, we actually saw that the, uh, the appraisal, the, the government official system is, is a very effective one. And uh, these people are human beings, good people, pragmatic and humble people. Um, that, I'll, stop to, I'll stop here. <laughs> well, there are a number of questions again, because I'm trying to batch them together uh, about talent, um, you know, where the talent is coming from, um, what do you foresee going forward? And another question is about university uh, research. So, uh, Elbert, you talked about, yeah. about that, you, you know, university in greater China and mainland China. Um, how do you see these kind of research becoming a driver for innovation and also anything that you might give us a sense on about the continuous education and training of the Chinese uh, workforce, particularly in the tech and innovation area. Oh yeah, Albert, I think this is, first? Yeah, this is so important. I'll go first. I mean, um, you talk about technology innovation or the future of, the, of, a, of, a, of a economy of a country. And the number of the talents, availability of talent is so important. You know, uh, I, I, I keep telling people that when I started, when I decide where to set up my factory or next um, set up in China, the number one consideration is not how cheap the, the, the city is. The co number one consideration is always whether or not I can find the right talents to, to do the jobs for me. And um, in general, the, um, um, I, I, think, I think you guys in the US would see that um, the Chinese students are mostly very bright students. They're very good in technology subjects. And um, in general, there are 90, more than 90 million um, students going through the Gaokao, the, uh, the uh, advanced level examination every year. So you talk about more than close to a, a 100 million people doing, doing that every year. So there's a lot of students competing into, into, these, um, into the university. So um, there, there's no lack of bright and good students in talents and everything. Um, I think um, they, they, they are concentrated in certain areas in Shenzhen, in Shanghai, in Beijing. And the, um, there, there are a lot of opportunity to, to bring them up. And one of the things that we are doing also in Hong Kong is that we are working with the universities to make sure that um, we are the, the hub for international technology talents to, to, to call this place home. We're going to provide a lot of policies and support and everything to, to make, make that happen. And you can be, you can be sure that the governments of Hong Kong, from China, from Greater Bay will be putting resources into supporting and attracting talents going, going into these areas. Um, um, if you talk about all the, the different, different areas of, uh, of development, um, um, I think um, the different areas in Shanghai, in Shenzhen, in, in Hong Kong, um, different things are happening, different, different policies are also, also given there. So um, there is no lack of policy to attract anyone who has an interest to come here to develop your career in technology and development. Right, but Albert, maybe you can say a little bit more. My understanding is, so for example, students who are studying in Hong Kong, a foreign student studying in Hong Kong, that uh, if they wanted to stay on, I think there's sort of preferential visas. Oh, yeah. And then, you, you know, you're probably the best person to yeah. talk a little bit more also about the financial side of the support, right? You know, yeah. for innovation and technology. Right. First of all, if you are a uh, a employee of one of the companies in our science park or the cyber port, we will give you we will get you a work visa within two weeks, and you can come here to work in Hong Kong. And there are a lot of supporting schemes in the areas of research and development. Um, uh, there there's government support schemes in the academic research, which is a different part of money. And in the innovation technology areas, we have another part of money 
in the range of 10 billion Hong Kong dollars, top of 1.2, 1.3 billion US dollars. And we call this the ITF funding, innovation technology funding. In essence, what it is, is that if you do a research and development project, not the research project in university, but innovation that you have a commercialization angle. Basically, you can spend, if you want to do a $10 project, you can spend only $3. The $7 will be coming from the government. And government will have no claim on the intellectual properties. Given that this, uh, the process of application is a little bit convoluted, um, typical government processes, but there's money on the table. We talked about 1.2, 1.3 billion US dollars of ITF funding. They will help you with your commercialization R&D projects. These are the things that are happening in Hong Kong that has been going on for the past few years. And um, companies like, I'm sure you heard about Sense Time, La La Move, these are the companies that have been using this Hong Kong government money to help them develop. So, um, and, and, and if, even if you go to go into China, Greater Bay Area, there are similar supporting schemes if you're doing research and development projects. So I would encourage you to take a look at it and you can talk to me and uh, we, can, we can get some of these going. Okay, Andy. Uh, I, I don't want to repeat what Albert said about the importance of the academics training and the vocational training. Uh, that's the most important point. So I guess what I would add is, I think that governments and research academic institutions in Hong Kong, in China, in the United States, really need to be focused on how to put communications and collaboration back on track after COVID is under control. Because obviously COVID has dramatically disrupted all of that. Um, the inability to travel among all these places uh, is preventing students, uh, researchers, investors um, from going back and forth. And I, I, I feel that all of the communications and collaboration is a little bit strained and more tense than it was before COVID. And so I think we can't just sit back and assume it's going to get back to normal again, and that everybody's going to have to really put a significant amount of time and resources in getting that back on track as soon as COVID permits. Well, I think the issue about COVID, as you say, is um, uh, there's also this narrative that um, you know, Hong Kong and mainland China, because it's a much more restrictive system on COVID, it's much more careful, much more cautious, is not yet able to open up like in Europe and in the United States, this notion of living with, with COVID. I mean, is this something that you think uh, perhaps by later on this year, this is going to blow over? Or if this is going to continue, uh, at least maybe for the rest of this year, uh, because China is so cautious. Uh, is this going to have a small impact on greater China or is this going to have a big impact? Uh, Christina, I think, I think um, much as I hope that the COVID will go away, I believe that we, we, have, to, we have to live with it for the for big part of this year, 2020. And in particular in China, I think it will be a little while before we completely open up, but we will open up eventually. Um, I think there will be uh, there will be some after effect of the um, of the lockdown and everything, but I think um, the one thing that I would I would I would say is that the Chinese people are rather resilient, and I think the most important thing is that the Chinese people, majority of those I would big majority of these people trust the government. Um, unlike other countries where you're 50 50, which is maximum, I think the um, the confidence of the Chinese government. I'm sure there, there are a lot of people who, who are who would complain and not happy with it, but the trust of the government, first of all, resilience of the Chinese people, and then the trust of the government is very high, even under difficult consideration. So we almost, you know, kind of the. I mean, I think most a lot of the Western people may not understand is that we we most of the Chinese people will will say that we, we let's go through a tough time together, and we have that kind of mindset that although it's tough time, let's go through that together and uh, there'll be hope in the future and there's trust, there's resilience. And uh, so I, I'm not gonna under, underestimate the, the impact and the difficulties, but um, we will go through and we have to go through it together and um, we, will, we, will, we will overcome. Andy, any final words on this? 
I'm obviously not a virologist or an epidemiologist, so I, I can't make a prediction, but I'm assuming that I'm not going to be able to go back to Hong Kong or China this calendar year uh, because I'm not prepared to go back if there's an extensive quarantine period before I arrive, um, since I generally go for a couple of weeks. Um, but I think getting back to one of the topics that we talked about before, which is how can the two countries and the two governments learn from each other? Uh, early on, uh, I think the rest of us learned a lot from how Hong Kong and mainland China were dealing with COVID. And they obviously were far more successful than we were in preventing deaths. Uh, the death rate per million population in, in both of those places was much lower than it, it is here. But at the same time, the situation has gotten worse, uh, especially in Hong Kong and now in China as well in terms of lockdown, but not deaths. And so I think it's time for the Hong Kong government and the, China, and the mainland government to learn from our experience here. And I think the primary lesson is that vaccinations are really key uh, because it, it seems clear that the problem uh, in Hong Kong and China is that a very low percentage of older people have received three jabs. And if they have three jabs, whether, whether it's the Chinese vaccine or the foreign mRNA vaccines, the risk of death is extraordinarily low. Um, and so hopefully they'll be learning from our experiences here and really accelerate dramatically the process of getting people vaccinated, which will accelerate the opening up and accelerate a return to communication and collaboration among all of our places. Yeah. Well, I have to say that quite a number of the other questions relate to uh, how to get US, China, US, EU, uh, and the problem relating to Russia, how to solve those problems so that the world can go forward. Um, if I can just use the final two minutes to summarize what I think I've heard from the two of you, uh, I will try and do that. Um, what you're saying is the Chinese government um, whilst it seems to be uh, very big and overpowering, which uh, in some ways the Chinese state is very large, uh, especially when you com compare it to um, the state in, uh, in America and the sort of thinking of big government versus smaller government. The Chinese government is pragmatic. You talked about Chinese officials today, that they are well-trained. Nevertheless, they are very keen to listen to people in the market, people who are doing the businesses in order to continue to shape their policies. Albert, you reminded us that there are five-year plans. There is a cycle to how China makes policy. And you reminded us that for anyone who is interested to have an understanding about China, to get to grips with uh, its policy making cycles, uh, to read the five-year plans, um, uh, that they're not so long, uh, and the Chinese tell you what they're actually going to do. Uh, we talked about uh, training, that there's obviously uh, a, a lot of education, various kinds of programs. And I think from what we have seen over the last 40 years, uh, it's not just training the elite, you know, the Chinese in order to be where they are today, they've had to really provide education very broadly uh, in China. You talked about the Greater Bay Area, Albert, which is uh, Hong Kong, Macau, and a good slice of uh, Guangdong province, including Shenzhen. Um, Hong Kong and Shenzhen are two of the places that um, uh, at Anderson School, they would like to visit. They haven't visited it for the past two years because of COVID. But I think there's general recognition that Hong Kong and Shenzhen in particular and Guangdong are very innovative and powerful machine for the Chinese economy. And Albert, you reminded us that actually mm -hmm. there's a lot of innovation there. There's a lot of government support for all kinds of schemes uh, that if people are interested that they should look into. Uh, you talked about looking forward and I, I think a lot of uh, discussion about tech, they tend to focus on internet related AI and so on. Those things are obviously very important, but in China, the breadth of the kind of innovation and needs that are happening 
uh, for example, pharma, you know, public health, the environment, green tech, all of these things are happening at the same time. So Elbert, you reminded us that when we're talking about innovation and technology, we can take a very, very broad look. And finally, Andy, the way that you advise your clients is if they're uncomfortable with uh, certain parts of, of um, uh, the Chinese, Chinese companies and the Chinese economy, there are many, many innovative uh, companies in the private sector uh, that are providing services to the Chinese market, the very huge Chinese market that are worth investing into. And for an international uh, investor, that obviously your advice is, well, you should spread your, your investments around and China remains a very interesting market. So I hope I've got the summary right. Uh, thank you, Albert, and thank you, Andy, uh, for joining us. And I'm now going to hand over back to Terry, who's going to close the conference. Thank you very much, Andy and Elbert. Over to you, Terry. Great, Christine, wonderful. I, I couldn't picture a more detailed on the ground look that gives us the essential of context. So a big thank you. And as you mentioned, I'd like to give a brief summary of five takeaways that I got from our three days. And then I've got several thank yous I'd like to extend. So I'd like to start with my first takeaway coming out of this last session and an important kind of message about the rapid ascent in the greater China region that economically driving a third of global growth, the role of entrepreneurship and the role of leapfrog innovation, that that is a huge reminder about what uh, people on the ground are seeing and what's happened in the country in terms of transformation. Second main point for the three days that I picked up is about the growing role of data, the role of data in a predictive way and the use cases that are creating more and more value. So if you go back to the e-commerce session, we talked about the ability of using data that can ultimately create the ability for companies to do predictive shipments, to better understand what to produce to eliminate waste, um, we talked about the same issue in data on the transportation panel with the idea of mobility as a service, autonomous vehicles, et cetera. So that whole role of data to me is the second uh, key takeaway. Third one is the role of platforms and more and more the idea of how are you delivering the insights of data that that's coming from platform-based businesses. And I think the best example of that was a discussion on blockchain in the uh, future financial services, how you can create a whole new way of conducting transactions amongst lots and lots of people on a platform itself. The fourth takeaway that I got here is about the growing distributed nature of the internet itself and innovation. So when Jennifer Zhu Scott talked about Web 3.0, the whole idea of an empowered set of innovators that as opposed to innovation happening just from large companies owning all the data, that we're going to see much more distributed ownership of data. And again, blockchain would be an example of that. Also, when Jennifer talked about a whole movement of managing your own data, we've seen a lot of that in Europe. We've seen that in the greater China region and somewhat in, uh, in the U.S. And then the final takeaway is what has been a dramatic growing uh, impact of public, public policy and regulation. And this happening across the globe. So looking at the idea about where government should be involved and what the benefits can be. So Michael Sung talking about, you know, the important role that government can play and specifically he's talking about the greater China region of managing a stable infrastructure layer. And infrastructure isn't kind of technical infrastructure, but it's infrastructure that allows on top of it application development. Very interesting uh, uh, view about that. A, a, a view about the need to have government and business be in balance as opposed to imbalanced. Um, the points that Ambassador Gross made about each region and each country has a different premise, a different history, a different context, that explains why they have different approaches on data privacy, on antitrust, 
on uh, social networks. And he resisted my uh, urge for him to try and give a first place rating in each region in terms of how they handle different issues, saying you've really got to understand the local nature. He also reminded us, and it's an important nuance and paradox, is that we do need globalization. We do need standards. So we need to understand the different premises. We need to understand in certain areas, policy will look different, but wherever common standards can be established, we create more scale that lowers cost. Wherever we can trade with one another, we create greater outcomes. Wherever we can deal with big global issues like climate change, we create uh, uh, greater outcomes. So let me just say a huge set of thank yous here. And there's a variety of thank yous because to get these type of learnings and outcomes, you need a lot of different players. First of all, I want to thank all of our guest speakers and moderators. They are a huge part of the learnings that we create, the moderators that really think about the essential issues and what needs to come out of our discussions, the guest speakers being content experts in their areas, domain experts, have created a huge amount of insight uh, for us. And our speakers and moderators, as you know, came from all over the world. They came certainly from the greater China region, and they came from all over the US. I'd also like to thank our gold sponsor, Newport Asia. I'd like to thank our silver sponsor, Cathay Bank. Our partners, which include the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall, the China General Chamber of Commerce, Los Angeles, and the UCLA Asia Pacific Center and the Eastern Technology Management Center. I'd also like to thank the student organizations that we've had that have been a key part of our success. UCLA's Chinese Students and Scholars Association and UCLA Anderson's Greater Business Greater China Business Association and the various areas at Anderson who have provided support. I'd like to do a, uh, extend a special thank you to Michael Wu and the Wu family for their long-term support and enthusiasm <clears throat> and their support around the focus of this year's conference on technology-based innovation. I'd also like to thank uh, many of my own students in my class who have been a key part of conducting research on these topics and supporting our moderators. I'd also like to extend a very special thank you to Lucy Allard and the Center for Global Management. They are the organizer and the host of this year's conference. They really make all the pieces come together and set a very high bar for what outcomes need to, to look like. And it's all been a big team uh, effort there. In normal times, at this time of the year, I'd be returning with a group of students uh, from Shenzhen and Hong Kong. And again, that's part of our global immersion. We unfortunately have not been able to uh, travel in the past two years due to COVID, but we are hoping next year, fingers crossed in March 2023, we'll be able to take a group of students to the region to learn uh, even more broadly about developments there. Technology is a huge focus for us at UCLA Anderson. Almost every industry today is impacted by technology and our leaders have to understand the role of technology. They have to understand the opportunities. They have to understand the negative consequences and be able to manage those and to be able to, to lead in a world that is technology based. Finally, let me just thank all of you in the audience for participating each of the days today, whether you're a student, whether you're a faculty member, whether you're alumni, whether you're a member of industry, your engagement has really made this a very, very successful event. Let's make sure we continue to uh, dialogue on these critical issues. A very big thank you to all of you. Take care. And if you're in the US, have a great evening. If you're in the greater China uh, region, have a great day. Thank you again.